Hello, I am Riele and today I would like to share this pastel painting process with you while talking some nonsense. Before I proceed with today's controversial topic, I'd like to say a few words about the painting itself. I was inspired by a picture taken by a friend of mine, you can check out her photographs in the description. The color scheme of the shot reminded me of old maps and I wanted to capture this character leaving the frame. I slightly changed the composition of the shot, tilting the shoreline. I like the ambiguity that resulted from it. On the one hand, she is exiting the scene beyond the frame into the vast unknown, and yet the shore narrows dramatically, leaving her nowhere to go. I am using white pastel matte paper that I toned with watered-down gouache and earthberry pastels for the most part, with a few scenario sticks here and there. Now let's talk about talent. When we first get into art, especially as adults, the gap between our abilities and the skills of artists we look up to seems immense. It is easy to conclude that they're just talented and we're not. In the meantime, we consume some motivational media with its main message, you can do it if you put enough effort, 10,000 hours and that sort of things. And fast forward a couple of decades, you either succeed or not, or anything in between, and you never know why. Because there are just too many factors. We couldn't do better than that, and we'd better be prepared. I have bad news. Inborn talent is real. Before I tell you why, let's define talent. Cambridge Dictionary states that talent is a natural skill or ability to be good at something, especially without being taught. This definition doesn't apply to art that well. After all, nobody over the age of 10 really believes that Leonardo painted Mona Lisa with no training whatsoever. Rather, we think that people are talented when they make great progress with minimal instruction. In other words, they are fast learners. And if we phrase it that way, it becomes obvious that talent is to a large part not just inborn, but also genetic. Learning abilities in the broadest terms do have a genetic component. There are multiple studies to show it, but also it's just logical. After all, there are very unfortunate individuals with intellectual disability caused by point mutations in genes involved in neuronal function. If one has such a mutation, it almost always has a predictable effect. These are so-called Mendelian phenotypes, named after Gregor Mendel and his green wrinkled peas. But there are other variants, that only slightly increase the chance of some problem occurring, and each of us carries some of these bad alleles. Each individual bad allele is usually not a big deal. As we have two copies of each gene, the second copy may compensate for the bad one. Also, related genes with similar functions can compensate for each other, and the environment may make it better or worse. The good news is that the ability to learn even applied to learning art skills is a very vague concept, so let's divide it into parts to make more sense of it. You may be great at one part and not so amazing at another. Imagine an average Joe who is trying to get better at art. For simplicity's sakes, he wants to pursue figurative art. He painted his first piece and it turned out very subpar. Our Joe looked at his piece saw a ton of mistakes, maybe he got some feedback from his friends. With all those comments, he decided to try another painting. He took into account some of the feedback he got, avoided some mistakes he made the first time, made some new ones, of course. The second painting is still not great, but it turned out just a little better, and our Joe noticed that progress and felt good about himself. He sees some mistakes in the new piece, but he is motivated to try again and this time make the new painting better yet. Fast forward a decade and he is a professional artist. On each iteration, there are many parameters. Here are some of them. 1. The quality of his first piece. Some people's starting point is just higher than others. 2. How much joy he experienced creating the piece. Some people can find more joy in art than others, regardless of the result. 3. Objectively. How much better the next piece is compared to the previous piece. 4. And subjectively. How evident this progress is to our Joe himself. 
Some people notice the tiniest hints at progress, and the others feel that everything below the level of Leonardo is rubbish. How much positive reinforcement he gets from seeing his progress? If no progress is evident, how tolerant is he to frustration? Sometimes the next piece even turns out worse than the previous one. For some people, setbacks are no big deal. They are eager to try again. But some people get disappointed and quit the first time they experience difficulties. 7. Then comes what is commonly known as executive functions. If he accidentally learns something wrong or suboptimal, how flexible he is to change his practice and learn a new method or approach. In other words, cognitive flexibility. Sometimes you don't have time to practice. Sometimes life happens. So another factor is how likely he is to continue practice regardless of distraction. And a connected point, how likely he is to pick up where he left off for internal or external reasons. Then iterate over a thousand times and you're a master. <laughs> All these parameters have both genetic and environmental components. For example, better hand-eye coordination, which to some part is genetic, makes it easier to control the lines or brush strokes and easier to improve hatching or paint application. Attention to detail and tendency to analysis, whether inborn or trained, may allow one to notice small improvements. The amount of joy one gets from creating and from seeing one's own progress is a textbook example of reward. Reward circuits are insanely important to motivate animal behaviors of any kind. If food didn't reward us, we would starve to death. And if sex were not rewarding, we would leave no offspring. And variants in dopamine receptors and dopaminergic transmission in general have been linked to differences in reward-seeking behaviors. Some people just experience more reward out of ordinary activities than others do. And those unlucky ones who can't find enough pleasure in self-realization, either biologically or through hardships of life, may turn to external sources of reward such as gambling, too much hyperpalatable food, smoking and drugs, and become addicted to these external sources. Tolerance to frustration, again, is a trait influenced by both genetics and environment and is a huge predictor of real-world success and achievement. A related issue is the ability to withstand distractions and temptations and work on tasks that are not immediately rewarding. And again, it's a complex trait with both genetic and environmental components. The most extreme tale of the distribution is attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, which has heritability up to 70 or 80 percent. People suffering from it struggle to concentrate on tasks with delayed consequences, and yet they sometimes get stuck on a task and perseverate, again involuntarily. This is the extreme case, but some attention deficit features are present in many people, and some are on the other extreme, with almost superhuman self-control. The ability to withstand distractions comes not simply to discipline, which we all can agree to be a positive trait. Think about compassion. Some people would jump to help their brethren when they even remotely suspect they're in need, but other people just mind their own business and work on their own projects undisrupted. One is not necessarily better than the other. If you break down your process into these nine steps, or even more that you can think about for yourself, you may realize that you are making progress and you are enjoying the process of art and process of learning, your executive functions are on par, but your starting point is just way below everyone else. The good news is that what you perceive as other people's starting point is usually not the very beginning of their journey. Most people are simply not sharing their first tries. But even if your starting conditions are objectively worse than those of other people, or you might have some real medical issues like tremor, you can still get better and progress. Regardless of what your starting point is or where you are now, you can always progress. It just might take more time and effort, but it's still possible. Or you may realize that your starting point was decent, you enjoy making art and seeing your progress, 
and you can push hard when it's getting difficult. You are disciplined, but you just don't see your progress. Here you might want to take extra care analyzing your art. Maybe finding a community or even a tutor who can help you see what is getting better and what is stalling and how to fix it. It might be all it takes to get the positive feedback loop going. Let's look at this learning curve. It depicts externally perceived skill or artwork quality over time. In reality, it's quite a bit fuzzier, but as a model, this will do. You start somewhat slow, especially in childhood. Then you join an art school or take classes. You figure out the fundamentals and dramatically improve. Then you again slow down and gradually and slowly improve until your limit or until you stop practicing. The thing is that people's limits differ and you can't predict it in advance. I am not sure that the person who learns the fastest has the highest potential. It is not necessarily so. It may correlate at the population level, but this correlation may be weak enough that we can disregard it when talking about an individual. You might slowly and steadily improve well into your 80s, or you can peak at 25, while most people are probably somewhere in between. However, many people stop before they reach their limit. Imagine how many artists from the past died early of infections or accidents and never reached their true potential. Nowadays, with vaccines, flush toilets and statins, we have a better chance to live until that point. Let's look at the other parameters. You may realize that everything is all right except for one. You can't handle frustration. You get irritated and want to quit. If you are aware of it, you can either work on it yourself, walk away, focus on something else and get back to art with a clear head. Also, you might be thinking in black and white terms. This artwork is either a masterpiece or a total disaster. But the reality is more complex. Maybe you messed up the values, but the composition is great. Again, a more multifaceted view may put things into a larger perspective, where failures turn into experiences. If, however, low frustration tolerance is a systemic problem in many fields of life, maybe you should think about therapy with a specialist. Another scenario. Everything is fine, but you can't return to a piece that you started yesterday. The solution might be, for the time being, as it may change in the future, to focus on smaller pieces that you can finish in one sitting. I usually don't recommend it, but if it's the only thing that works, give it a try. If we take myself as an example, I feel that I started strong and made decent progress. I've always been aware of my progress and got immense pleasure from it. I can also deal with frustration, especially when I have no goal in mind. But making art itself is not as pleasant for me. I just don't enjoy it most times, because art is difficult and stressful and I don't like to put effort into things. I've never lost track of time painting the same way I do coding or analyzing data. It is somewhat medium dependent. I hate watercolor, but I surprisingly find chalk pastels all right. But I don't need to enjoy every minute of it. I can turn on an interesting history podcast or call a friend enjoy the podcast or the conversation and just bear with the process of painting and then enjoy the result. When I was younger, I used to sketch in class, enjoying the class more than what I was drawing. No wonder I ended up a biologist and not an artist. Also, figurative art is not one giant indivisible monolith. You might realize that some aspects come to you intuitively while other things require a lot of effort. When I started drawing, I never had problems with hatching. I was not taught how to do it, I just observed and mimicked what I saw. It came naturally to me, and even in my earliest attempts, when the shapes were off and the tonal values suffered, the strokes were clean and followed the shapes of the objects. Now I hardly ever draw, so I never progressed further. On the other hand, I struggled a lot with understanding color. In the beginning, I omitted it altogether, painting grisaille after grisaille, using ink as watercolor. Then I transitioned to simple color schemes with one color for the light and one color for shadows. Yellow ochre and ultramarine, or paints gray, and carmine plus phthalo green were my top picks. 
Then I gradually transitioned into full color and actually took classes, but it took over a decade before I could systematically harmonize even a simple real world scene. But now I feel that I got to a point of being overall happy with my colors and I can freely paint what I want at least in that regard and that I would find unthinkable a decade ago. Sometimes these specific talents are quite unexpected. I have a friend and a muse whose portrait is on my user pick, who took some art classes in primary school, but not much beyond that. But she was amazing at putting together multiple human figures in a composition or designing very complex ornaments. Her overall skill was decent, but nothing out of the ordinary. But these compositions were impressive. I have one of them in my collection and it is a tiny postcard. Now, having almost 20 years of artistic practice, I am nowhere near what she could do in her teens without any effort. These examples show that you can be good at one thing and not so great at the other, but working on several aspects is way easier than working on everything at the same time. Analyze your art, harness your strengths, show off your best, and put less emphasis on what you are yet not so good at while working on it. Please share your thoughts in the comments, like if you like this video, and subscribe if you're interested to hear how to choose subjects and tasks to get the best results with limited skill.